Um, <clears throat> my name is Gabriel Chapman. I am the senior uh, senior manager of NetApp HCI Go to Market. So basically, I'm just like the the HCI whisperer with inside NetApp. Uh, I lead a team of solutions architects and experts globally who are dedicated to bringing the message and story of NetApp's entry into the hyperconverged infrastructure market uh, to the masses. Right. Um, you know, this is my probably fourth or fifth time presenting here at Tech Field Day. Great event. I've always loved what they've been doing, even back before I became one of the, the red uh, lightsaber wielders um, <clears throat> and was not able to actually come to Tech Field Day as a participant. I always wanted to, so but I've always had a special place in my heart. Uh, for people who really wanted to get and understand the technology and dive in a little deeper level and get past the marketing fluff. That said, <clears throat> there may be one or two marketing slides in here because the marketing people sent me here, but I will try to gloss past them as much as possible. We'll start with the first one. Um, <laughs> Stephen may not like this. I found this on Twitter today, but um, you know, bacon is our god because bacon is real. Um, so let's start the day off a little. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm actually quite uh, perplexed that there's no bacon here, given my Twitter handle. But you know, it's like, you know, here you go. We'll start with that one. But let's reality. Uh, let's in all reality start to talk about why we are here. You know, we you know, Stephen was talking about. Uh, you know, all the HCI, all the HCIs is really popular. It's interesting that it's almost like the year of HCI, ten years before or after the year of VDI, whenever that year will actually end up becoming a reality. But you know, the reality is we've kind of gotten to this point where there are so many participants in that marketplace. There's what roughly 38 companies that work in the hyperconverged infrastructure space. There's some big dogs in there. You know, all the major OEMs have gotten there at some point. We've heard uh, you know acquisitions. So recently, SpringPath was acquired by Cisco. We saw that SimpliVity was acquired by HPE. Nutanix went and IPO'd. By the way, um, you know we've seen this space grow and expand, and we see you know the fourth permutation of an HCI product come out of Dell EMC. It is a very real ecosystem in a very real space. Five years ago, when I first entered this place or this space of technology. It was a hard sell, right? I had to go in and talk to people. I had to do a lot of education. I flew and saw 500 or 600 customers in an 18-month period and you know, really kind of had to really push to evangelize this space. But today, a lot of people take it for granted that hyperconverged infrastructure is a solution that they can leverage inside their data center. Some of the reasons why is if we go back and look at how infrastructure and how we've provisioned resources over the last few years has changed, I look at this kind of curve, right? There's enterprises kind of at the, ter the turning point. We've kind of started out, we consolidated workloads, we started to virtualize workloads. We got to the point where we wanted to automate as much as policy and be actually driving a policy-driven data center or policy-driven infrastructure. When I look at what Amazon does, when I look at what Google does, when I look at what Azure does, if I'm an IT administrator or an IT organization, how do I stop my customers, internal customers, going to them, swiping a credit card and provision a workload? Because they can do that in 15 minutes and have it up and running, Meanwhile, I may be trying to figure out what the base IP address is for that machine or what even the naming convention is or if it's even gotten into the ticket system by then. Right? So there's this, all this pressure that sits in the external world where these as-a-service type offerings, these cloud-like offerings, the agility that they offer is what I compete with internally. And it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it's the truth. There is no way to make the leapfrog from traditional legacy infrastructure to cloud overnight. I'm not going to take Exchange and containerize it. Right? But there are going to be some other solutions that I do go out there and leverage to put forward that. So I have to evaluate my infrastructure, evaluate my workflows, evaluate my applications, and see which ones fit on which side of the puzzle. Because eventually we'll all start to move towards that particular model. And this is the space that hyperconverged infrastructure competes with technically on-premises. We will use the word correctly for once. Just kidding. Um, as a customer, we all have lots of consumption choices. And some of this, I, I think I've presented some of this before in the past, but the reality is, is if I am a company who has technology that I leverage on a day-to-day -day basis, I have these kind of four different modes of consumption that I can leverage. I can consume resources as a service. You know, how many of you have used Google Docs? How many people here have used Salesforce? How many people have you, here have used these different technologies that are basically pay, to, you know, pay per drink, pay per use? And that's one way people can consume resources. At startup companies that I've worked for, and I've worked for several, um, we didn't have huge IT departments. I didn't provision a huge piece of infrastructure. I had the one guy who imaged laptops and set some ACLs in the network, and then everything else was a service that I, I, I used and leveraged because it didn't make any sense for me to spin up a huge amount of infrastructure. At the flip side of that, we have people that have PhDs on site, they have data scientists that have like true legitimate tech ninjas who know more about 
you know, kernel file systems and everything in that particular realm that I will ever know in the rest of my life that can build versus buy, and they do. Right? If I go look at what Twitter does, if I look at what Facebook does, if I look at those types of companies, the hyperscalers, the large service providers, the large service integrators, they more often than not, based on the type of workflows or solutions that they're providing, will build a solution. Twitter has a 500 petabyte Hadoop cluster. They're not going to put that on a storage array. Right? They're going to go buy a $400 server that has no shroud on it, and if it breaks, and they'll, you know, they'll combine all those together, and if it breaks, they just throw it away because it's a fungible resource. They don't care. Right? But the vast majority of us sit someplace in the middle. Right? We have purpose-built solutions that are very rich and robust and integrate with the workflows and solutions and technologies that we have because that's the way we've done things. And then we have a look at converged infrastructure or hyper-converged infrastructure because that takes a lot of the complexity away from how we provision resources. If I look at it from the NetApp world and NetApp viewpoint, I have these two parallel operating systems and a concept called the data fabric. For us, the data fabric is global data portability, mobility, visibility, security. I have vision into my data where it sits. I understand who's accessing it. I understand how long it needs to be retained. I understand who needs to be, have access to it and whether I need to secure it, whether I need to archive it, whether I need to pull it from the cloud and pull it on premises or put it in cold storage for long term. There is a concept here of data being currency and how we leverage it inside the organization. In that construct, though, I have these two parallel operating system paths and tools and solutions that can integrate across those different consumption metrics and consumption continuums. You know, whether I want to run a fully functional version of ONTAP in the cloud and leverage it as a service, or if I want to leverage the Fueled by Solid Fire program. A lot of these technologies, A, are built into the long-standing 25-year history, 25 year history that NetApp has leveraging ONTAP technologies, and the second is part of the Solid Fire acquisition that happened back in 2016. And how we integrate with these different disparate consumption models is just a means to an end to integrate with a larger portfolio of technologies. There is portability, there is visibility across all of these different consumption spectrums and not just locked into individual silos for each and every one. So, if I go back to my days when I first started getting involved in a hyper-converged infrastructure, the story I would tell you would be, hey, I'm, a, I'm here to take the complexity of all these disparate technologies and products, because what are they at the end of the day? They are just a bunch of commodity x86 resources running Linux. Well, heck, that's just uh, something I should be able to virtualize, right? I should be able to virtualize all those constructs, put them in a single form factor, provision them to you, put a slick wrapper around them, and there you go. you got infrastructure in a box. Let's start stacking them up and go out that way. And that's really the first generation of the messaging of Gen 1 HCI was consolidation and simplification. I could come to you, the VM administrator. Hey, you need storage? Right-click, create storage. You're done. You don't have to design for RAID. I can take all the complexity away. I can abstract all the complexity away from those things and make it really simple because you guys are now the new kingmakers, right? The reality is, is most organizations are a little more sophisticated than that. But the simpler we make things, the less attractive they are to a sophisticated environment. So I can go after the low-hanging fruit. Yeah, I can do the DHCP server, the DNS server, and the Win server, and the print servers, and those types of things. Am I going to use my production Oracle OLTP database on this? Maybe. Just depends. Right? If we look at first generation hyperconverged infrastructure solutions and the architectures that they leverage and design, they made choices that helped them get to market quickly and help them meet the needs of a certain segment of customers. Right? If we go back and we go about a couple years, where do they try to fit into? They try to fit into VDI because it was a very linear, scalable type of solution. It met the needs, and I kind of put everything in one, and every 100 desktops I wanted, I scaled out. But if I started to put workload three, four, and five on there, the performance would suffer because there's no way for me to actually segment the performance on there. In many respects, it was a hybrid type of file system. So I was using Flash to do some stuff real quick to do caching, but then I was still having to rely on spinning disk for the vast majority of my uh, storage remains. And if I ever defeated the cache, I had to go to spinning disk, and maybe there was only four or five of them in the box. And guess what? That's not a lot of spin account for performance. Right, so we didn't see a huge number of customers running highly performant workloads on there that required sub one millisecond read-write latency. I go further into that, I look at the flexibility of a solution. Anytime I take a one-size-fits-all approach, I'm going to make a trade-off or a caveat. Right? I always have to placate the lowest common denominator in that respect. 
So maybe I wasn't able to scale resources the way I normally would in an organization. How many people traditionally scale compute and storage and memory all at the same time every time? That's not normally how we, res you know, we, we, we reserve or leverage resources. Many times we get a project that comes in, oh, I need five terabytes of storage, but I may need you know, another 25 sockets of compute. Well, if I'm bound to a one-size-fits-all model, I have to scale all the resources at once, I may get imbalanced. I may have too much compute, too much memory, or too much storage, and no way to actually leverage it outside of that particular initial silo that I've deployed in terms of the HCI product. That leads us to workload consolidation. If I can't control performance, and I can't flexibly scale my resources, how can I go in there and put my prod, test, dev, and, you know, and, and QA all on the same platform? Well, no. What I'm going to actually go out and do is I'm going to build a silo for one, the other, and the other. And therefore, you get past the vision of this large shared pool of resources that we want to leverage. And actually, we're back to the same way of computing. We're just consuming it in a different form factor, a different metric. So, you know, that's kind of some of the stuff that we started to find as we started to talk to customers. We started to talk to analysts. We started to talk to partners. Um, in terms of what we're bringing to market, it's a little bit different. Uh, I mean, some may say that it's not quote unquote HCI. And, you know, and I can have that discussion all day long about what is and what isn't HCI, but ultimately it's an outcome. And there are different values that you can in ingrain into a solution based on those outcomes. For us, because of the technology and the architecture that we leveraged, we have the ability to kind of have these three metrics of, uh, you know, of, of differentiation in compared to the marketplace. I have the ability to guarantee performance. We're leveraging the solid fire storage technology under the covers. That's a very mature storage model. We're on version 10 of our software. We're on version 4 of our hardware. We've got six plus years of production environments in the ecosystem. We have some of the most demanding data center workloads on the planet in the service provider, cloud, and enterprise space, leveraging this technology on a daily basis. We simply you know, recompa uh, recompose it or repackage it down into a form factor that would fit hyper-converged infrastructure. We have the ability to flexibly scale our resources. If I want to scale storage, I scale storage. If I want to scale compute, I scale compute. I'm not bound by a one-size-fits-all approach. So I don't have to scale all of those resources at once. And if you start to really look at a lot of different workloads that exist in the data center, there's some real drawbacks to being able to, or forcing yourself to take a one-size-fits-all approach, right? Uh, ultimately, we also have the concept of automated infrastructure. I want to leverage APIs. I want to leverage automation. I want to leverage simplicity. Ultimately, at the end of the day, hyper-converged infrastructure is a lot of times about the simplicity of provisioning infrastructure and the simplicity of, one, day zero implementation, but also day one through 768 operational states. Uh, one additional point that we bring to market that's a little bit different compared to some competitors in the space is it integrates with the portfolio of products that NetApp has already has on the market. That's our integration with the data fabric. It's the ability to migrate data between a FAS and an HCI system and a storage grid and an AltaVault and a cloud on tap and all these different disparate products and have that kind of global data mobility visualization into that, build, that, that data and the ability to secure it. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So... Under the covers, what it is. At the end of the day, and I've made this analogy probably a thousand times, HCI is kind of like an EpiPen. You know, it's an auto injector. I have $4 of medicine, and I have it in a $7 you know, d delivery mechanism, and I sell it to you for $300, right? Because it's, if I am somebody that is allergic to bees or fire ants or whatever it is, right, I don't want to have to run to my car, take out a syringe, put it in a, a bottle, pull out the medicine, and inject myself because I'm probably going to pass out before I actually can do that. So sometimes the packaging is actually worth the extra additional cost. At the end of the day, what we have here is storage technologies based on a very robust, mature, enterprise-class, cloud-scale storage technology baked into a hypervisor that is predominantly 82% of the market and things that most people use and are very familiar with. So you have a very mature hypervisor. You have a very mature storage system. What do I do now? I build a thing called the NetApp Deployment Engine. It's a packager. What it does is it goes out, packages these resources together. I will basically provision a vCenter instance to control and manage it. I will have plugins that integrate with the vCenter, and I can drive it all right from there. And, and that's really, you know, and then I start to bring a little bit more pieces above the, above the table. At that point, I have data service integrations around 
you know, the traditional data reduction technologies and high availability and self-healing, you know, inline dedupe compression and provisioning across the entire cluster. Those are part and parcel to the storage system that sits underneath it. And like I said, it's very mature. Then we have integration points with the data fabric, whether it's SnapMirror, Snap Center technologies, how we integrate with, you know, a common S3 output. There are all these other technologies that we've integrated with and worked with over the years as well that are all part of this part, you know, part and parcel to the solution as well. And then there's the third-party ecosystem, companies like Veeam, Commvault, Datos, okay. others, that we know as the virtualization space has come to rely on those technologies, hey, you, know, you can use us and SnapMare for backup and DR replication if you want, but why reinvent the wheel and force somebody to do something else in different motion if that's what they've already invested in? So if you've invested in a Veeam as your backup and replication strategy, well, we'll integrate with it and it provide some additional value. It's kind of like, you know, why we don't include switches with it, because switching is religion, right? In most organizations, nobody's going to switch from one switch to another just because you brought in a really slick box that does some fancy stuff, you know? And that's, it's, it's, it's the traditional layer eight issue, right? The politics of most organizations. So, I mean, we could do that. We could also bring in a software-defined networking construct to work with it as well. But we need to make sure that those technologies are mature enough to facilitate what we actually want to do in terms of an end game. So that's kind of the high level of what it is. Am I turning on lights? All right, sorry. Um, I'll just take away a little bit of glare. Uh, it actually looks like this. Fancy bezel. Make sure you get your pictures. Um, but no, in reality, so, so hey, standard 2U form factor, four node form factor. So 2U, four nodes, the nodes can be either storage or compute. Right? So I have a storage node that provides storage services. I have a compute node that provides com compute services. What you do not see here is a controller virtual machine that sits on top of either of these systems. So we're not taking resources away to turn the box on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But at the end of the day, really, you have the ability to combine compute and storage in the same 2U form factor and scale those resources at a 1U half-width increment. Um, so let's, let's dive into these other control, you know, these other aspects a little bit deeper, and then we can go a little more of the architecture itself. So for us, guaranteed performance is leveraging a lot of the technology that SolidFire pioneered with our guaranteed quality of service, right? The ability to consolidate mixed workloads, deliver predictable performance, and essentially provide granular to control at the larger aggregate, but down at the ultimately the virtual machine layer as well. So how do we do that? Well, by basically we are able to dynamically allocate manage and guarantee performance to individual volumes in your organization or as you provision them. We do that by setting the min, max, and burst of the performance characteristics of those volumes. Right? So I can go in and say, hey, workload A, you get 100 IOPS uh, for your minimum. You get 500 IOPS for your max. You get 1,000 IOPS for the burst. Because we do know that workloads will get chatty. They will get bursty. We will see organizations and implementations where, hey, I just, just set the volume up and let it go, and I don't know what's going to happen to it. So what we see here, we see a workload that doesn't have a minimum that's really very high. And what happens when it starts to compete for resources for other volumes with inside the solution? Well, it, it, its performance goes down because its minimum is not set very well. But if I really do need to punch up the performance and guarantee its predictability, I can change that minimum from one level to another, and now what happens? I have guaranteed workload predictability in terms of the performance that's being delivered. So I no longer am competing for resources because I've guaranteed the minimum. Then I've basically set the floor. I've created a walled garden effect around that particular workload. Um, in real practice, it looks more like this. How many times have you tried to work, run a bunch of disparate workloads in your environment and something happens? Somebody like myself who basically doesn't know how to do anything with a database, does a, a table query that like scans the entire planet, right? And next thing you know, I have this workload that's kind of brought everything else down to its knees and it's in the middle of the day and they're trying to run payroll and next thing you know, nobody's getting paid and everybody wants to come and cut my head off and put it on a pike. This is not Game of Thrones, but it's close, right? Um, <laughs> oh God, season no seven, are you crazy? No yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> but... We do see this more often than not. As somebody who spent a good part of his career as an end user managing storage and virtualization, you know, we always like to say, well, oh, it's the network. The network guy says it's never the network. It's your application in the storage layer because it's not performing because somebody else is stepping on top of you. 
right? That's the one thing that's like, if you look at HCI, the simplest part to manage is the storage because it's usually right create, create a volume. It's the most complex, sophisticated system to actually implement as a foundational layer, right? So you look at all the work that do, is, is done and almost all the technical deep dive elements around hyperconverged infrastructure is based on the storage subsystem that actually operates and manages the system because that's the part that's the hardest to deal with. We already had a great file system that did this. Right? So I could go in after the fact and say, look at all these workloads that are running. Well, let's normalize performance around each and every one of them. Right? Hey, VMware, base VMware, virtual machines, all that low-hanging fruit, we're going to give you this swim lane to play with. And then we'll give the, the database tier this swim lane to play with. And VDI, we know that at some point in that day that a bunch of people are going to come, from, you know, come back from lunch and it's time to play you know, online poker, so they're all going to log on at the same time and they're going to punch up all that relations. And instead of crushing everybody else who's actually trying to get their work done, we're going to give you the performance that you need and segment those. So when we look at workload consolidation and the ability to guarantee performance, I can really start to play the game of Tetris with my infrastructure, right? Because no longer do I have to guess if I have enough performance. I don't have to do any weird math around spindle counts. I don't have to worry about pinning volumes into specific SST tiers. I don't have to worry about some kind of you know, algorithm that's going to predict something. I just say, you get this performance, you get this performance, and you get this performance, and that's it. I'm done. And if you need more, I hit a button, and the performance is there, and is there immediately. Right? I have three questions to answer. How big, how fast, who accesses it? And I've done that. I've done all the things I need to do for storage. Done. Now I can go work on something else. I can, <coughs> I can containerize exchange then if I want. So you, you still, you want, you want the administrator to hard set those values? I do. Or, so, I mean, I mean, that's great for a limited scale, but I mean, as you scale, I mean, what data can you grab about the workloads that can start to do that themselves? So there's a couple pieces of information I can do that. There's a couple ways that I can also do that. Let me, let me move one slide further here. I can do that at the aggregate, right? So I can go and build my VMFS file store in my big bucket and put virtual machines in there. I can turn on something like storage IO control and give shares because that's what organizations do. I can leverage things like storage-based policy management. So as I provision from a programmatic approach, I can say, hey, base operating system disks in my organization, if I'm leveraging VVOL, all get 50 IOPS. Do they need more than that? If they do, then I create a different policy for it. I don't have an innate ability to you know, read the mind of your infrastructure. I do have some tools on the back end that can do that. We have a product called OCI that can scan your environment and tell you everything that you've ever wanted to know about the storage infrastructure you have and give you 100% actionable intelligence to go and back and place data in the right spot. I can find out if data is stranded. I can find out if something's been provisioned too much. I can find the thing that's maybe been given too many IOPS and actually tune it back down. But that's not inherent in the actual file system of the HCI solution itself. It's a kind of an add-on thing. I mean, nope. I mean, that's where the value value would lie. I mean, if if we're you know we're adding petabytes, uh, you know, storage every few months, whatever it's going to mm -hmm. be, the workloads are continuing to increase. I mean, we're, so I'm a, I work for a service provider, so I mean, this is our our life we live in. If we go and we manually set it. It's only as good until, you know, then there's a problem. Then I have to go manually set it again. If you can provide us some dynamic understanding of, yeah. you know, this is, a, this is a SQL database workload. This is what we've seen inside of your environment, inside of other people's environments. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big So I have six there. years of history across pretty much most every service provider in the industry mm -hmm. uh, that I can go in there and say, we based on what they, how they've tagged their, their workloads. Right. Yeah, so, so if, I have a, if I put a tag on my virtual instance, it's a SQL server or whatever, okay, this is maybe the I.O. profile it looks So like. I have a thing called Active IQ that is a cloud, basically a cloud discovery solution, or it's a cloud management platform that kind of gives you analytics and telemetry into the actual clusters that you're running. Uh, I also have a 100% API-driven ecosystem with inside my own platform that will allow you to pull any piece of data you want. If you want to integrate with something like Grafana and do it locally, if you want to use our Active IQ instance, if you want to write some kind of chargeback that says, hey, I see that this particular set of volumes keeps peaking past 500 IOPS repeatedly, maybe that customer needs to go to the next tier of storage. I need to offer them that uplift. And for me, that uplift is hit the button and now they're at 1,000 IOPS. I'm not migrating any data. I'm not doing any data motion or, or movement or anything of that nature. What I'm doing is instantly providing them that additional storage performance without any cost on my back end. Yeah, and you're providing a way for us to monetize it, which is obviously a great Monetization value. of storage within the service provider uh, arena is 
what we've, what we've called fueled by solid fire and it's an area we've been very successful in. I could give you the long list of service providers who leverage our storage on a daily basis. Uh, there's about 300,000 customers that use solid fire on a daily basis have no idea they're using it because we've been selling storage as a service through other service provider partners across the globe. That also applies into our, our world here in Hyperconverge. We take those values of service providers that are looking for, they were looking for multi-tenancy, they were looking for security, they were looking for scalability and performance because no service provider wants to write an SLA check, right? Because if I break something and I, I don't meet the needs of the customer, and heck, I don't know what they want to put on our data, on our systems. You know, I got, hey, I just sold this guy 50 VMs or whatever it is, right? Um, how do I actually sell them the storage tiers that allow them to do that? How do I control it? In many instances, I had four different storage arrays in the back end, and I gave them to one storage array, and if they couldn't, if it wasn't performant enough, I had to do a migration event, and maybe there was some downtime and some bunch of complexity, and maybe I was making a guess at it. For us, it's a simple API call or a slider that makes that performance go up or down, and we get to apply those principles into our hybrid converse system as well. I can do this at the volume level, so the big VMFS data store, because we're, starting, we're talking about VMware here initially, but I can also bring it a, a little more granular down to the individual virtual volume or virtual disk layer. So leveraging storage-based policy management, going in there identifying the characteristics or that policy-driven automation down to the individual VM level provides a lot of value to it as well. Because maybe I have 20 different standardized workloads templates that I want to leverage, if I do a little bit of work up front, it saves me a whole lot of pain in the end, and then I know that I'm not going to compete for resources. And then I have all the management tools in the world that I already have either in place or in trench or I can leverage the VMware that can give me the analytics back, as well as our own management platform that sits outside. Um, going a little bit further here, optimizing for scale. You know, flexibility and scale, scalability on your terms is kind of the way to say one size fits all is not so great. Right? I mean, it, it can be in certain instances. I bought a all-in-one printer in 2007 that was a color laser brother. You know, it was like 2,700 bucks, right? And that was awesome because I got rid of my flatbed scanner and I got rid of my you know, fax machine and my base printer and I got color all at the same time, but it was $2,700. And when it broke this year, what did I do? I went to Fry's and I bought one for 99 bucks. What did I pay for? I paid for the ink. <laughs> Because the hardware wasn't worth anything. At the end of the day, the software-based technology that we put inside this thing is the ink. But then again, if I would have taken that $99 printer into my office with 200 people and tried to run that as the, the print services and the scanning services for all those people, it would have burned out in 15 minutes. It's, I mean, how many of us had that discussion with our, with our CTO or CFO or CIO at some point and says, well, why can't I just go down to to the Best Buy and buy a terabyte hard drive and put that in the data center, right? I mean, how many times did I had that discussion? At least a dozen times. Well, because the minute more than two people hit that hard drive, it's gonna melt, right? So there's a difference between, you know, something that can do something and something that can actually facilitate and do it at scale. So, you know, we have these different concepts here about how we interact with solutions. We want to optimize and protect our original investments because it's great that I have the new shiny on the floor. I'm not going to throw away everything else that I've spent money on that's still depreciating tomorrow, right? It's like the Borg. Eventually, you will be assimilated, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I also have the ability, like I said, scaling compute and storage independently provides a lot of value in certain response in certain instances, especially depending on the size and granularity of the scale that does it. But then there's a, a concept called the HCI tax, right? It's it's leveraging overhead to turn the lights on, and not getting exactly what you've paid for always. And that's not always the case per se, but there's an instance here where we see these different layers of, depending on what you're provisioning, it could be a real challenge to make that TCO discussion with your CFO. Digging into it a little bit more, we have, first we started with this, said, hey, under the covers, this is an all flash storage array that we've integrated with VMware and packaged to people who want the consumption dynamic that is smaller in scale and that has a lot of simplicity baked into it. That's essentially what HCI is. Right? I don't want to get hung up on definitions of it having to have direct attached storage in every single node because there are benefits to that, but there are also trade-offs against it. Right, I might be able to get into a very small unit of measurement, but if I'm doing it for HCI, or sorry, for VDI, 
and I need 10,000 desktops, and the amount of compute I need is so disparate based on the amount of storage I'm actually provisioning, I could have, you know, what, 200 terabytes of storage sitting there completely stranded because all the other solutions don't let you leverage it, right? I have an open storage model. So not only is it providing storage for our hyper-converged infrastructure solution, but it's iSCSI storage at the back end, and I can still manage it that way if I want to, so why not connect my Docker or my OpenStack or KVM or Hyper-V? I'm not going to restrict you from leveraging the storage that sits in the box because you've paid for it. Why not use it? If I'm not using it for all the VMware instances that sit on that system, use it for something else too. That's flexibility. That's, that's investment protection. That's getting value out of what you're buying. Right? It's flash, right? Technically, it's still expensive. Ultimately, I want to get the most bang for my buck. I want to get to 80 and 90% utilization rates. I don't want to have a bunch of storage sitting on here that I can't use for anything else unless I put it, virtualize it, and put it on that platform. Um, in terms of a solution that has utility across multiple disparate models, we go back to that um, set of models we were talking about, the different consumption spectrums. This is the same operating system across the solid fire all flash array, across the FlexPod SF, which is the Cisco-based FlexPod based on solid fire technology, and our hyper-converged infrastructure. It is the same OS. It is the same technology that sits underneath it. You can replicate between all three if you wanted to. You can integrate these solutions at some point down the road between each other. It's providing flexibility across what we say that, hey, if you want to consume it this way, that way, or the other, it's still there. There's no code fork here. This is software defined. It's the ability to implement it in other areas and not necessarily bind it to one specific consumption metric. Oh, and some, well, that's a little too movity. I just made up a word. Um, movity. So for us, start small, right? Uh, we don't have a one, you know, we don't have a two U solution, it's a four U solution, right? Because there's certain minimums we need to require. Uh, it's around four storage nodes because A, we like high availability and we will like N plus one redundancy. Uh, you can start with two compute nodes. I can scale to 32 compute nodes and 40 storage nodes at the base max. It's about 1300 cores, two and a half terabytes of memory, uh, two petabytes of storage and three million IOPS. That's usually enough to run Crisis definitely can run Quake on that, right? Gamer jokes. Um, <laughs> grow as needed, grow on demand, non-disruptive non upgrades, a word I hard always struggle with. Uh, kind of the key here, too, though, is we want to have portability, and, and we want to make sure that it's a living ecosystem of infrastructure, so the forklift upgrade goes away. If I go back to the original Solid Fire customers, the first one we sold to, the very first Solid Fire unit, I can take version 10 of that software and run it on the very first box we ever shipped, as long as the customer's in their support. And we'd probably give it to them anyway because they've been a customer for six years. But the reality is, is that that's what we're trying to get to. We want to make sure that the underlying systems still support. We may change out the compute that we use all the time, like every you know, two and a half years when that new, you know, the new processor scheme comes out. I can change that compute out if I want. Maybe the storage still has five to, you know, three to four more years of life in it. I don't have to get rid of it. It's still going to be compatible. I don't have to worry about EVC or anything like that, right? It still ends up being a storage construct that I can leverage for as long as I want to, or I can switch it out as well, right? So we have different sizes of, 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 of these different constructs. Essentially, you start with nodes that are available individually for scale. I have three different types of storage nodes. I have three different types of compute nodes. I can mix and match them within reason. Right? So it doesn't have to mean that I have to put them all in the same 2U chassis. I can mix and match them. I could have two storage nodes and two compute nodes in a 2U chassis. I could do all four storage nodes. I could do all four compute nodes. It's up to you how you want to consume those resources. But I have these measures of you know, the T-shirt sizes of implementation, small, medium, and large. Small, medium, and large for compute, <coughs> and small, medium, and large for storage. So it's anywhere from that 16 cores to 36 cores, 384 to 768. You know, we're using 10 slash 25 gig in the network inside, so we have a little bit of pump, you know, we have a little padding in there. In the storage layer, it's anywhere from 5.5 terabytes to 44 terabytes based on effective capacities, 50,000 to 100,000 IOPS per node. So if I have four of them, I could have 400,000 IOPS in whatever 44 times four is, because public school math and I don't agree. Um, but, you know, like I said, you start with four of the same type, and then I can scale those resources. And it's scale one at a time. 
right? I don't have to scale four at a time. I don't have to put an entire block of services in there. Once I meet the minimums, four storage and two compute, <clears throat> all right, I want to scale up my compute. I keep doing so. I'm scaling my memory and CPU resources. I'm attaching a license based on whatever consumes a license or so, you know, a, a socket or cores. And I continue to do that, but you know, maybe a new project comes along. I need some more storage. I put another storage in. Guess what I'm going to scale? I'm going to scale the storage as well as the performance of that storage based on the type of node I put in the system. Because we don't always scale everything all at once. The one-size-fits-all approach has its benefits in certain very linear workloads. But if it's nonlinear, if it gets any level of sophistication, and maybe, heck, I didn't have enough budget to buy you know, the big block. Maybe that's my challenge. But for me, I can sell you a compute node to give you the horsepower you need to run those extra virtual machines because maybe you have enough storage, but I can sell it to you for half the price of a combined node. And people who cut checks like that. Is every storage node the same? Can I have <laughs> tiers of storage nodes? No. They're all, essentially, it's all one cluster. Right. right? So if I go back to the SolveFire world, you know, if I had four 2405s and two 192.10s, it just presented as one pool of storage. And all the performance of those would be there. So the four 2405s would give you 50,000 each, so you're looking at 200,000. The two 192.10s would give you 100,000 each. So you're looking at a, you know, a 400,000 IOP pool yep. and some amount of capacity pool. And those are, the, those are the knobs I get to twist, right? How much consumption, uh, how much uh, performance do I want to consume? How much capacity do I want to consume? I don't have to design or architect for high availability. I don't have to design or architect for RAID because it's a RAIDless architecture. It's shared nothing. It's scale out. If something like a drive fails, the rebuild time to provide it back into high available state is about seven minutes. If a node was to fail for whatever reason, I can have that back high available again in less than an hour. We design for failure because that happens, right? You know, I, I use the analogy of uh, the no bad Christmas. You know, I used to have to carry a, a pager at Christmas time, and what would happen is invariably I would get a call on Christmas morning because something broke, and I'd have to get my pajamas off and go down and miss the, you know, miss the um, <clears throat> disappointment on my children's faces because they did not like what I bought them for Christmas. Now I get to sit at home in my slippers, and before I even got into my pajamas and started to drive out the day, the data is already highly available again. I get to see how disappointed my children are. I buy the chassis um, empty. Uh, the chassis will come with either one compute node or one storage node. We're not we're not we're not going to provide just the empty chassis, but you could actually buy it in such a way that you might yeah. have a chassis that's you know you don't have to put the nodes in there, sure. right? It could be sitting there empty, but we're going to ship them with either one chat one storage node or one compute node. So I guess that was going to lead towards my question of why do you need more than one storage node in a chassis? I don't Is it just because you're starting small and you wanted that four at a minimum? Um, no, if I, if I go back and look at this, I <clears throat> don't need to have a storage node in a chassis. We're just showing you the illustration that you could put them anywhere you want. I could put a chassis with all four storage nodes and a chassis with all four compute nodes. They don't have to intermix with inside there. But every chassis has the disks, so... No, you, every chassis doesn't have disks. Only a chassis... Here, I'll go back if I have it here. Um, only... Storage nodes have disks. Compute nodes will get blanks. It'll look like disks, but there are no. So it's kind of hard to see with the glare in here, but a compute node is essentially a diskless node that gets in, implanted. So I slide that in, and it has its connectivity for so, networking and storage. So the disks are in the nodes, they're not The disks are on the front. front. Right. The nodes themselves are stateless. Right. So, so if, if I, I plug had, a storage node, if you had node sold in. me a four compute node, mm -hmm. and then I decided that, you know, you would still it doesn't have storage. any disks in there, so no, there's no actually point. you wouldn't. No. So if, if you had four compute nodes, right. and you wanted to take one of those nodes out and put a storage node in, yeah, you would basically put the storage sled in and put six disks in. It's always six. It's drives. always six disks. It's always six drives associated with each storage node. Okay. A compute node has no drives associated okay. with it. Is but like a compute a node will get blanks. Is that like a dedicated PCI path to that? No, or a South Pass. Or a the back or end is uh, is uh, is all top of rack switching for interconnectivity. We don't actually interconnect internally. Okay, well, the, the, the six oh. drives in the front though. How do they connect to the? the it's it's the standard backplane that sits with inside there. Okay. 
what what is that? Is it like a SaaS backplane or is it a PCI backplane? I do not know. Okay. So like the <laughs> 6100 model chassis? Kind of. They have the, yeah. yeah. Um, but ultimately, everything within inside this piece is redundant. Yeah. Do, do, of, when I add six drives, do I have to reboot the chassis? The chassis is, it doesn't have, there is no controller logic in the chassis itself. Okay. So, so I can add six drives, I can pull nodes, reconfigure nodes, move things around, never have yep. to reboot the actual chassis itself. No, the chassis is just basically a, a, a vessel. Rack. It's, yeah, it's essentially just an empty control. It's an empty box that's simply waiting to uh, absorb resources. So a new compute node comes in, I slide the compute node in, and I fire that up. Yeah. If I get a new storage node, I slide that in, I put the disks in, and I fire that up. Okay. But the chassis itself is simply, like I said, it's just kind of a, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's the Nintendo 64. It's waiting for the chip. It's waiting yeah. for the, uh, the cartridge to go inside before it does something. Um, let's see, we'll go fast this. On it before you put it. He said Nintendo 64. <laughs> <laughs> I did say I did. I did not say I did not say Atari 2600. You know, the lifeblood of my uh, my youth. Pitfall, man. I never did finish that one. Um, so it, when I look at some of these architectural choices that some of the first gen solutions did, they built really cool systems, right? If I go back six, I mean, I go back to 2009 when most people started working on this stuff. You know, think about how much technology has changed since then. If I was going to build a new, brand new uh, HCI solution from the ground up today, and I didn't have any tech debt or anything like that, I'd probably build it all as containers. Um, that said, you know, we work on things, and we can only work with what we have in our, in our viewpoint. And a lot of the first generation systems basically decided to take a controller virtual machine and virtualize all the data services and virtualize all the control plane inside that. Right? So I have a CVM, and it uses resources. And I put that when it could use up to four or eight cores of CPU per node. It could use up to 120 gigs of RAM in some instances, depending on what system. It could be completely hardware assisted as well, have a specialty card. It just depends on what approach they took in terms of architecting and designing that first solution. But they all use overhead. And sometimes if I turn on specific data services, because maybe my file system is pretty nasty and it's not quite ready for prime time yet, and I have trouble scaling past four or six nodes because I don't know how to manage metadata, then, you know, I'm kind of bound by certain restrictions. So I don't turn on global dedupe. I don't turn on global thin provisioning or compression. Maybe I use erasure coding, but I only use it for a certain sub-segment. And that injects complicity, or complexity, right? Complicity, really. Um, for an example, if I take a one-size-fits-all approach where I have to scale all my resources, storage and compute, every time I want to add another node, what am I going to do? In many cases, I'm going to increase the cost of my licensing whether I need storage or compute, right? So if I can't, at a fine-grained level, in a very simple way, scale my storage resources independent of my compute resources, what happens when I'm running any kind of core-based licensing? Look at what SQL did. SQL said, hey, we're going to go ahead and charge you by the core. Great, I just wanted five terabytes of storage, but I had to put two, compute, two controller, you know, two CPUs in there because... I needed this one-size-fits-all approach. I'm going to get out of balance real quickly in terms of my licensing. The hidden costs in a lot of HCI is the additional cost based on the controller licensing for CPUs. Whether you need it or not, if I'm building in a VDI environment and every node I scale with has 10 terabytes of storage in it, and realistically for 5,000 virtual machines that are doing VDI, I may only need 20 terabytes of storage, period. But I might need 20 nodes of horsepower in compute. If I have to bring another 5 terabytes of storage with each one of those, I have a bunch of storage sitting there that I effectively do not use. It's wasted. Wasted resource. And because my storage model is closed, I can't connect you know, uh, you know, an exchange farm or a SQL farm from outside into it with some other compute. I'm locked into their model of consumption. So by having an open storage model, A, my storage capacity and performance isn't stranded. B, I can scale in, and uh, I can scale storage and compute independent of each other so I don't get locked into this lockstep unit of measurement. And C, I don't pay a penalty for licensing for things I don't have to. Keep building the slide because somebody likes to build stuff so much. Do you have any Christmas? Um, getting to 
The other part of area, you know, the other area that we thought was very important for hyperconverge as we move forward towards the next generation of it, automate all the things, right? And there's that little meme that's got the little, I don't know, it looks like a fourth grader drew it. Um, but I want to automate and streamline management. I want to deploy rapidly because there's the value inside of HCI that is I need to get it up and running in an hour. And if you don't do that, that's, you know, that table stakes. I want to have a comprehensive set of APIs where everything is some code that I can leverage. Because not all of us are going to sit in front of a GUI for the rest of our life and do stuff. Right? Um, so in terms of that provisioning model, we take, you know, you plug a USB stick in the back of the box, it copies a breadcrumb file on there, it has the first IP, I plug it in my laptop, I hit go, give me my username, except the EULA, right? give me my username and password, what are the IP addresses for storage, what are the IP addresses for virtual machine networking, and at that point I'm off to the races, 45 minutes later I have a functioning system. What are we actually doing under the covers is I'm taking these nodes, I'm doing a discovery process, I'm going to target the ones that I want to be storage, and provision the Element OS operating system. I'm going to target the ones that I want to be compute and put the ESXi hypervisor on there. I'm going to build a vCenter instance. And then I'm going to inject my plugins in there to manage it. And then I'm going to basically spin up a management node, the one virtual machine we use, that basically is a data collector for alerting and management in phone home. And then I'm going to integrate with our active IQ cloud-based management platform that does telemetry. So I'm going to package all that together. That's, that's, the, that's making the EpiPen for our customers that want to use HCI. It's taking all of that complexity and turning it from like 400 different steps and in, in, in inputs and turning it into 30 and making it simple to provision and, and do it. I could do it all by hand if I wanted to, but that's not quite as fun as putting in some IP addresses and going grabbing a cup of coffee and coming back. I mean, but unless I enjoy, you know, <laughs> unless I read the book, The Joy of Menial Tasks, <laughs> and I really thought it was a New York Times bestseller, I would rather not do that. So the monitoring node, that's one? It's you, one virtual machine. Well, one VM. Okay. Yeah, it's one VM. It's a lightweight VM that basically does all of our collector stuff. And that's, you know, that's a carryover from the solid fire days, right? I had a controller VM or a, a monitoring node VM that did my ability to collect data locally and provision it out. If I want to get crazy cool and do a bunch of stuff in Grafana, I can do that as well, right? Because uh, if you go talk to my friend Aaron Patton, he will show you all the cool new hotness that he's done with inside there. We have some customers that do that instead of leveraging our cloud to do that. That Active IQ cloud, which is based on MongoDB, which is like a super awesome scalable platform. Um, and then obviously, you know, direct hypervisor integration. I mean, why would I reinvent the wheel to manage VMware? Doesn't mean I can't. Right? It doesn't mean at some point down the road we won't build our own you know, third-party management platform and make this into a cloud operating system where things are containerized and packaged and deployed and put across you know, whether an Amazon or an Azure Stack instance or something else of that nature. The reality is as we launch and go to market, 82% of customers run VMware. They have 500,000 deployments. Right? So it's, it's a decent-sized market to go after. You know, if I was going to go after the KVM market, I'd kind of be limiting myself. But I understand why diversity of hypervisor experience is important. Because, you know, maybe the market is skating away from VMware sometimes for certain types of customers. Going back to that open storage model, you can still run KVM against us. You can still run Hyper-V against us. You could run Docker or, you know, whatever it is. We're just not going to have the same level of integration in terms of that turnkey provisioning experience but we still can support them, right? They will still run on our platform. We won't stop you from doing it. Like I said, more utility out of the platform that you're using instead of locking you into one consumption metric. <clears throat> In terms of API integration, when we built SolidFire, the first three iterations, the first three software releases, we didn't have a GUI. It was just API calls. Our customers were service providers. They, didn't, they didn't never see a GUI. They didn't care what it looked like. They just wanted to know, what are my API calls to provision block storage as a service? How do I consume that? How do I protect it from one, you know, one uh, workload from another? And then we started to get you know, enterprise customers, people like myself who have a hard time coding the words hello world into notepad. I need a picture <laughs> to work things, right? 
Um, I usually misspell the hello part too. Um, but you know, I had integrations with tool sets, whether it was you know Puppet or Chef to integrate with. If I'm looking at you know Ansible, if I look at you know native Docker plugin capability, that's in there too. If I want to do things around PowerShell and be Josh Atwell for a day, I can do that, right? Um, I have the ability to integrate with software development kits around Perl and Python and Java. Now, I want to give you a lot of access to different tools because not everybody does things the same way. Right? I want to be able to automate all of those things as well. When I look at some solutions, lots of people say they have an API, right? And they do, right? And the reality is, though, that sometimes those APIs are bolt-ons, and to do something simply as provision a volume and grant it some specific characteristics and set snapshots and all that stuff, it could be anywhere from, you know, what, eight steps with dependency chains and 190 lines of code, because gosh, that's what I want to sit and do and make sure I don't screw that up every time I redo it for one volume. Or I can go into UI and do a slider and enter four different inputs, or it's 12 lines of code in an API. I, <clears throat> when I focus specifically on SolidFire as, as part of our office of CTO, I would go in and say, I don't necessarily want to talk to your storage people because they won't necessarily always get this, but your developers will, your cloud architects will, your application designers and developers will, because when they want to initiate storage inside whatever application or workflow they're working with, if they can copy and paste this and make it repeatable and very easy, they will do that because then they don't have to bother anyone else. Right? And that's how we get programmatic in our nature. Everything we do inside the UI, if I hit a checkbox, it'll expose the call and response. If I want to make that repeatable, I copy and paste, and I use it over and over and over again. <clears throat> it's getting simple. It's one step and 12 lines, plus the little brackets, right? Um, data fabric, obviously a big piece with inside the NetApp world, right? How we integrate with the other pieces of the portfolio. You know, we want to harness the power of the cloud. We want to build the next generation data center. Uh, we want to modernize your, modernize your infrastructure. How does the HCI product do that? Well, essentially, it's data fabric ready. How many people are familiar with SnapMirror? Okay. Well, we built SnapMirror into the product, right? I can SnapMirror from the HCI product to a FAS. I can integrate with things like Storage Grid for object storage. I can integrate with OCI, our analytics piece. I can do replication, and I can do data protection pieces but I can also run a virtualized version of ONTAP on top of the solution as well as part of the product. It will come with it. You will have a certain, ter you know, a certain amount of storage capacity that you could dedicate to running ONTAP Select as a virtual machine sit down there and provide very rich, robust file services with 25 years of history behind it. I would challenge anyone to, have, you know, to, to, to do a better implementation of NFS, SIFS, et cetera, than NetApp. It's the one place that we really have the market cornered in terms of robustness and solutions integrations. Why would I not offer that as part of the solution I'm bringing to the market when it comes to hyperconverged infrastructure? Because if I look at the ecosystem today, file services are an afterthought at best. In terms of targeting of workloads, um, you know, we kind of have this, this area that focus that we're going after, right? I don't want to play in the $25,000 remote office branch office space. It is just not a place I'm interested in. <clears throat> Personally, as an organization, we saw that, hmm, based on the platform, based on what we've built, based on the value we're bringing to market, based on the fact that it's all flash natively, we're not going to be able to play there either and make a price point that anybody makes any money. So let's go after areas where people are not playing as well or need to, right? Because if I look at the larger ecosystem of customers that are out there, I see a lot of enterprise customers that have been on traditional infrastructure for a long time that are looking at specific areas of growth and would like to consume resources the way HCI is provisioned, but don't necessarily think it's robust enough. So we're going after internal private cloud. We're going after large-scale workload consolidation. I'm looking at Web 2.0 infrastructure. I'm looking at next-generation data centers like Mongo and Couchbase. If I give you an example, right? So here's day one. Traditional HCI strategy is to land and expand. I get the first workload and great, I'm gonna get a whole bunch of others. But then customers quickly realize that they can't protect those workloads from each other and they back off and it becomes another silo sitting in the corner for just PDI or whatever else. For us, because we can protect, protect those workloads and we can segment them, customers can start to play Tetris with their infrastructure. 
right? I can continue to add different disparate workloads one at a time until I get to some level where I'm comfortable. I can leverage different pieces of automation and integration into those workloads and solutions as well. I'm not bound by a small silo of resources that I manage. I can start to really look at my infrastructure, the disparity of the workloads that I use, and actually enact them in a larger, broader space with a unit of consumption that's much smaller than I'm normally accustomed to. Five and a half terabytes of storage, 16 cores, 384 gigs of memory. I can start that small or I can go bigger. So really what we're looking for here is just in particularly is going after the broader pieces of the puzzle that we think HCI should be able to go to. If you look at the marketing messaging, that's where people believe it needs to go. But it may not necessarily be there yet. So that's uh, pretty much the story here. I just want to touch base on the last three pieces. We're looking at guaranteed performance, flexibility and scale, and automated infrastructure. Backed by an integration point with a portfolio of products that span pretty much every use case when it comes to storage. From on-premises, from, you know, from the core to the edge to the cloud. So there you go. Thank you. So can we dive deeper into this a little bit here? Um, do you still yeah. have the slide, the picture of the back of these things? Yeah. What's the connectivity between the various nodes? It is bring your own switch. 10 gig or? 10 slash 25. So the back here is you have to SFP28. Every node. So you have a little flexibility here, right? Storage nodes have two 10 slash 25s, two 1 gigs for management that you don't necessarily have to use, a one out of band management. The compute nodes have two nodes for virtual machine traffic and vMotion, et cetera. Two nodes for storage tra or two ports for tra storage traffic at 10 slash 25, two for management and one for out of band. Now, you don't have to use all of those. I could combine everything and have two cables come out of the back of this box. But I do have customers that want actual physical segmentation between virtual machine traffic and storage traffic, so the option is there. So I'm going to go to the top of your 10, you know, 10 gig, 50 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig switch, and then I'm going to do my discussion there. In terms of our performance, you know, the way we handle data, you know, everything comes in, it's broken into a 4K chunk, hashed, compressed, dedupe, etc., coalesced into one megabyte chunk, written captured in an NVRAM card, replicated between one node and another, committed to disk. All that happens within sub one millisecond. In that traditional 4K 70-30 workload, that's where we're targeting that 40K or 50,000 IOPS per node discussion point when it comes to performance. We can do more, we just tend to be conservative in terms of what we market. And you're just kind of separating out like the iSCSI traffic over its own VLAN or something? Yes, it can be completely segmented out through its own uh, VLAN. It could be completely going to a set of physical switches that you've dedicated to iSCSI traffic, or it can be converged networking. And then I missed it. Did you have a speeds and feeds slide? Like that says CPU, RAM options, storage options? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 16 to 36 cores, 384 to 768 gigs of RAM, you know, various ports. Uh, it's all on the website. Uh, in the storage side, it's, you know, we're looking at that five and a half to 44 terabytes of effective capacity per half width 1U, right? Um, different size disks that go inside there. The disks denote basically the capacity with inside the system. We'll be supporting larger size disks at some point in the near future. But then again, you get a really heavy storage node inside a box. Now you're looking at imbalancing, right? If I had a 100 terabyte single storage node inside my, you know, and then I have to go buy, you know, what, 100 compute nodes to take advantage of it? Yes, sir. Can you add regular solid fire nodes in the same cluster? Just going to ask that. Not at 1.0, but quickly to follow, yes. All right. So, the, like I said, that slide I showed you that had the three different platforms, you know, they're, they're intermixable. All right, so if I already have solid fire on the floor that, and I wanted to augment my HCI, I could add a solid fire storage node. It's the same operating system. You know, they have to be the same OS, obviously, or the same level, right? But the reality is it's, it's the same technology, different form factor of consumption. So in theory, you could start with, you know, just compute nodes because you're doing a compute refresh. And then when you get to a point where you need to expand your storage capabilities of your existing solid fire, you could just start adding storage nodes at that point? Um, 
I would have to check with the sales powers that be uh, whether or not that would be something that would be a, an option that would sell. But yes, you could obviously buy the compute nodes themselves. I think in uh, how things are quoted, there's certain realities around how we do that. I'm not sure if we would just sell compute nodes just yet. Obviously, after the fact, after that initial first purchase, mm -hmm. I'm sure we would. But the, the inverse would still work in a sense of, since this is, in effect, a solid fire storage array, um, that if I had existing compute clusters, you know, going back to your licensing discussion about SQL, if I already had a separate SQL mm -hmm. cluster, I could use this and share it out to there yes. already. Yes, at the very first purchase, we're probably going to require you to buy at least four storage nodes and two compute nodes. At the, after that, it's up to you how you want to consume those resources. If you want to connect a super dome, if they still exist, go for it. And are you recommending at least a minimum two chassis just for chassis The minimum two chassis is because we need six nodes minimal, right? I need four storage nodes and two compute nodes to be the minimally viable product. And realistically, how many people build a two-node ESX cluster? But, you know. I, I see it a lot so more well. very often. So it's there, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, if I didn't want high availability, and I didn't want, to, and I didn't care what happened to the system. Yeah, I could build a two-node uh, solid fire and a two-node compute cluster. But then, if it, you know, if, if something went bad, you lost all your data. But maybe there's some people who like to use these as skeet targets. I don't know. Yeah, but if you're replicating it to another site, then this just kind of becomes a robo node. It, it could be, right? Or I could actually sell you something else that's a little more suitable towards that particular market, based on the price point those customers are looking for, right? <coughs> which is on Tap Select on Bare Metal Portfolio Company. Not one size fits all. When you say bring your own switches, are you planning down the road to integrate with, say, spine leaf infrastructure? There will be a point, yeah, there'll be a point where we start to get a little more sophisticated in the network and we start to investigate more heavily into, you know, whether it's uh, Cisco or, or VMware in terms of the networking that they're doing, um, or even things like Open Contrail, et cetera. You know, it really depends on the way that, that market goes and who the winners and losers are. And the IOPS performance be over-provisioned? Yes. And in fact, in many instances, like the last release we did, we actually got uh, something like a 130% increase over single volume performance from the previous release, just simply through a code update. So I tend to be very conservative in terms of what I can provision. And I kind of say, hey, here's your hard and fast rules. Hey, I can still over-provision memory in a VMware instance. I can over-provision CPU to my heart's desire. It's just a matter of when you know, the metal meets the road, 